What's up, everybody? Harris Van Riper here with Rick Holland. Uh, we just want to jump on a quick video recording to kind of discuss one of the or the the main blog that uh, Rick put out this week about the Iranian cyber threats. Um, it's, it's picked up a lot of traction and a lot of you know good responses and positive feedback from it. So we wanted to just jump on and kind of walk through it for uh, for you know people who want to just kind of get the audio version of it. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, this is mainly a practical advice uh, for, you know, practitioners and um, kind of why you shouldn't be too, uh, you know, hyperbolic in this situation. And, you know, we just kind of wanted to have a very level-headed kind of discussion about it. So um, your presenters today, you can see on the screen, it's Rick and myself, and then uh, part of the Photon Research team. Um, so, so yeah, so let's get kicked off into it, Rick. Well, one of the, one of the things, and we've talked about it a little bit in other media this week. We, we didn't want to be hyperbolic and we didn't want to be sensational um, and we didn't want to be clickbaity. If that was the model of our analysis and our assessments this week is we didn't want to be clickbaity. And I led the, this blog out um, on Monday, uh, first Monday after the, uh, the conflict really got going with Iran and the U.S., um, and so we'll just walk through it and some things have changed since, since I wrote the blog. So we'll talk about that because there has been responses um, from Iran, but let's go ahead and dig into it. Um, if you haven't seen it, this is the blog that's out there. Um, and it's the Oh my God, cyber Iran. Basically this one was built off of a tweet storm that I did the Friday morning after the attacks got going. And I started to see talking heads out there talking about imp impending cyber attack and cyber war so on and so forth. So I really just did a, a tweet storm on it that turned out to be pretty popular. And then I thought, let me do a blog on it because I can capture more um, nuance and perspective in a blog. And now we're doing a video format. We've also had a little bit of a podcast conversation on it as well. So uh, each time that we've done this, we've learned a little bit more and we have a little bit more uh, analysis on it. Um, the first one was, let's not panic. Um, if you look back, over the past 15 years, 10 years, you know, we've gone through phases where it's like, oh my God, it was China and everything was China and then everything was Russia. And then it's a very overlapping group of threat actors and we panic about everyone, that sort of thing. Now is not the time uh, to panic. The one thing I would say if it's Iran or any other nation state, if a nation state wants to target you, they're gonna target you. Even if Iran has less skills than the United States, the United Kingdom, Israel, uh, France, Russia, Russia, yeah, right. You know, I wouldn't scoff and we've seen, um, we've seen a lot of defacements and I've seen people that are laughing at that as like, Oh, look at the, the capability here. I would not minimize Iran's, uh, offensive cyber uh, operations capability. Um, they, they, they can cause uh, damage, but we shouldn't panic. Um, and when we look at our security programs, you know, you want to build a, a program that has controls that will protect against, you know, 80% of the threats that are out there. Um, not the unicorn threats. Um, and we have some suggestions specific to Iran as we dig into this. Yeah, and I think one point also, I mean, you say that you shouldn't scoff at the kind of Iranian capability, like the stuff that we have seen from Iranian nation state, you know, suspected threat actors is mainly destructive, right? I mean, there's a lot of destructive malware, a lot of wiper malware that's that they kind of put onto systems and kind of wipe out the whole the whole environment. So, I mean, that's... It's pretty devastating for you know a company that uh, maybe is managing sort of like the energy sector or something like that. So yeah, definitely not something to just kind of take lightly. Yeah, certainly Saudi Aramco does not scoff at um, destructive malware, um, or even you get into the kinetic space where you didn't have as much um, attribution with drone attacks on oil refineries and things like that. So uh, we need to take the threat seriously if it's in your threat model, and we'll get to that. Uh, but the key thing is you know breathe, don't panic. Uh, so it gets to, the, to, to something we actually talk about quite a bit here is, is threat modeling. And, you know, the, the, this, this, the events over the past week and a half are just going to be another in a long line of, you know, significant threat actor activity that you see out there, be it back in the day when it was APT1 report and everyone's like, oh, what do I need to think about that from a China perspective? You know, it doesn't matter who the actors are. You need to have a threat model and you need to ask yourself questions like, you know, how is my business impacted by these interests? Um, how has historic Iranian targeted targeting um, uh, and the victimology of Iranian um, attackers related to me? 
I put a link in the blog and I have a screenshot here from the diamond model for uh, intrusion analysis, uh, which is a really nice tool for intelligence analysis, but you can look at um, the victims and how they're targeted. And if you see your vertical um, peers, competitors being targeted, that's a, a good indicator that you could be in the mix as well. Um, and then supply chain attacks, we talk about third party risk quite a bit. Um, we help customers with third party risk as well. So I think the really important thing that should be the foundation of all this is what is your threat model? And if you don't have a threat model, um, you should get started um, with one. And we'll talk a little bit about MITRE ATT&CK a little bit, which will help out with some of the modeling uh, as well. But if you don't understand your threats, then it's not really a good place to, to be freaking out um, until you've done that. Yeah, I think also with TTPs, right, examining kind of past TTPs that have been associated with nation state threat actors from Iran um, helps, right? It helps to kind of put that into your threat model to see where even on like separate attacks that may not have been, you know, associated with that stuff, if the same sort of TTPs line up um, and you know that you're vulnerable in that situation or in that specific tactic or whatever it is, spear phishing, for example, um, you know areas that you can start to kind of hone in on and mm -hmm. start to put in some uh, defensive measures for it. Helps you prioritize. I think we're all overwhelmed on the defender side with the number of controls, the number, um, the attack surface that we have to defend. So threat modeling is a really good way to kind of help you focus your, your very limited resources. I talked on Twitter a little bit um, this week about, you know, value and investment value and having threat models helps you get more value out of your very limited investment money. So one of the ones, and this was the nice thing about starting it out on Twitter, um, I got some questions back and then I was able to use the blog uh, to respond back. But um, Anton, who many of you will know as a former Gartner analyst, he and I were, I guess, competitors in a way uh, when I was at Forrester and he was at Gartner. Not that we ever really thought that, I don't think, but um, covered similar areas, talked about the same things. But uh, Anton brought a good point up about collateral damage. Um, your threat model may not include Iran. However, you could still be a victim of collateral damage. It's a really good point. And Maersk would be a excellent example of that with NotPetya um, and the $870 million of damages that they received and then some challenges with their insurance. So uh, my, my response to Anton I had on social media and in the blog is that you, you should probably have collateral damage from nation states or others um, on your threat model, but you have to think about likelihood um, and, and impact. And the impact could be quite high from something like NotPetya, you know, destroying all of your computers, but the likelihood of that happening is pretty low. So be aware of it, talk about it, but I wouldn't prioritize it over something that perhaps maybe insider threat is something that's more likely to cause you problems in your own threat model. Right. I think, I mean, to that example, if you look at somebody like MeDoc, who is being used to kind of spread a lot of the uh, malware, I don't know that they necessarily thought that they were going to be wrapped up in anything like that. But, you know, it makes sense in hindsight, right? It makes sense that they might be targeted from that perspective. But, but yeah, so I mean, it's, it's nice to try and use history as an example to look, you know, as at yourself and at your own company and see where you can kind of improve in that area. The MEDOC one is an interesting one from a third party risk perspective. And I think that applies to, to the threat modeling with Iran. You know, who, um, if you're an ICS um, provider and you look at the, there's been ICS supply chain attacks and things like that. So you definitely want to make sure that you're doing um, an effective, as effective job as you can with third party risk management, which I appreciate is a challenge for organizations. So the next one up uh, is communicating up the chain of command. Now, by this time that we recorded this, most organizations will have already had their C-suite asking questions early this week. Uh, I think the follow-up questions now might be more along the lines of, okay, you know, Iran launched um, um, missiles at an Iraqi base housing U.S. Uh, personnel in, in Iraq, um, and Trump had a speech, and it seems to be de-escalating. So now that's going to kind of be the, the communication path that you're on. The, the key thing that I would say here is don't let the pundits and the talking heads, you know, set the narrative in your organization, you know, understand your threat model, understand the risk of a particular threat actor to you uh, or country to you, and then be able to communicate that up. One of the things that I wrote in 2017 that I added into this that wasn't in the blog, but I did a piece about how to tailor your intelligence to your consumer. 
Um, and in this case, this is early on in President Trump's uh, tenure, um, and his approach to the daily intelligence briefings is very different than others. Uh, so I go through six uh, suggestions on how to communicate with a difficult or just new customer. And so I would recommend that blog to you if you haven't seen it. Um, and in that, it's, it's in the link of the other blog that I did, but I would uh, take a look at that because that could be quite useful in, in, in communication styles. And I also, um, related to this, I run the SAN Cyber Threat Intelligence Summit, which is now going to be in just about a week and a half. And uh, we have uh, Lenny Seltzer, who's going to be uh, doing a talk on how to write intelligence products. And then we also have a workshop with Katie Nichols. And we're going to have a component in there about uh, communicating up the chain of command as well. So it's really important from an intelligence production perspective. If you don't communicate out effectively, then why bother even producing something? Yeah, I mean, knowing your audience, right? Like to distill all that down, knowing your audience, I think is key for any intelligence product. And even when I was writing, you know, for Digital Shadows and I was writing Intel products, it's... It, it requires a lot of editing and it requires maybe a little bit extra time and some more, you know, kind of focus on it. But the end product is something that will be very valuable, very useful for, for that reader. So knowing who you're writing for is, is key. It all fails. If you don't write a good product, doesn't, you could have the greatest thing and you're high-fiving yourself. Um, but if your consumers don't understand it, don't appreciate it, or it's not aligned with what they're interested in, it's a fail, right? Absolute fail. Um, so just do the basics or just do the boring as I like to joke. Um, now Rich and I did a similar session to this, um, this week as well, uh, where we looked at, um, the Australia Sign Australian signals directorate, which, uh, for those that aren't aware, it's the Australian version of the, the GCHQ or the NSA, and they all partner together. Um, if you've seen Snowden leaks, uh, they, they'll come up into play there as well. Uh, but essentially we went through, um, and Rich did this blog here where he mapped MITRE ATT&CK to the, uh, these eight controls um, in the essential eight there. And they're very practical things for spear phishing, uh, limit reduced privilege, very fundamental common things that are out there, but absolutely critical. And again, it helps you with a high watermark no matter what your threat model is or who your threat actors are. If you put these things in place, it's going to help your program out. Yep, for sure. And I'm not going to go into it because we have a whole separate 20 yeah. minute session that, that Rich and I did. Uh, so I would recommend that to you if you want to learn more about the essential eight. Um, and then also if you look, want to look about APT 33 and 34 and how uh, controls can map against their TTPs. All right, Dora, the Explorer fans <laughs> in the house, uh, swipe or no swiping. I never saw the new Dora movie that came out, the live action one. Did you see that? No, I did not. Yeah, even me having kids at, with fans of Dora Explorer, I have not, <laughs> have not seen that. So I can't really make any recommendations, listeners, if you should watch that film or not. <laughs> but you definitely don't want swiper wiping in your environment. That was dumb. I admit it. <laughs> I'll give myself a yellow card uh, for that one. Um, but if you look at one of the main things that Iran is known for is destructive malware. You kind of already allude to that mm. at the top. And this goes back to, you know, first response post Stuxnet, if you will, uh, with Shamoon and Saudi Aramco. Uh, this is, you know, a, a likely um, um, pattern. And I think one of the things we've been talking about since um, the de-escalation has started is what does a uh, de-escalation in the kinetic space mean for potential escalation in the cyberspace. Um, and so perhaps you might see, again, these types of activities that Iran is maybe not attributing to themselves, unlike launching missiles from their, their own country. So, so ransomware, ransomware is a pretty, um, pretty uh, I say, destructive malware is a pretty important thing for us to think about. And what I'd add on to that, what I put into the blog is if you're already doing um, threat modeling and tabletop exercises for uh, ransomware. Essentially, destructive malware is ransomware without a key. Mm -hmm. So I'd build this into your tabletop exercise and have a plan on how you're gonna recover your systems. Right, right, yeah. I think um, looking at it from the wiping perspective, I mean, the fact that it can just kind of wipe everything out, it makes backups even more important which then goes back again to ransomware um like you say you just may as well build it into kind of the program that you've already got running if you do have it running already yeah we do tabletops a lot at digital shadows in our q4 tabletop we did an extortion 
uh, tabletop that did have a, a ransomware component to it. So I would highly recommend you do it. And if you think about value, I talk about security value, uh, you are not going to have to spend a lot of time. You can do it remote with your remote people over a Zoom or a WebEx. Um, you're not buying new security controls. It's a conversation and it's a half day worth of actual live effort and then the prep time. So it's good value for a program. Denial of service attacks are our good old favorite. And you know, this also goes back to some of the early retaliation that we saw post Stuxnet as well of the, the US banks in uh, 2012 uh, with the Alcazem cyber fighters um, very effectively for some period of time um, taking the US banks offline. So this is something that we could see as well. I think uh, tabletop exercise here as well. Hopefully if you're an e-commerce company or something like that, you're gonna have these controls in place. Um, but if not, you need to talk about it and think about it. Yeah, it's definitely something that it's been around for so long that, you know, I, I don't want to say it, it'd be surprising if, if, you know, some more people who would lose money by not having access to their services have not thought about it. But, you know, there's always people that, you know, are, are lower down in the maturity scale. Um, so, so yeah, so it's definitely something to keep thinking about. Yeah, I don't think you would see the success on financial institutions right. DDoS attacks like we saw in 2012. Um, but if we're talking about some of the hacktivists and defacements and things like that, some of the lower hanging fruit, bottom feeder type of uh, you know Iran affiliated actors, this could be a technique that they use. A couple of things to think about there is if you don't have any mitigation in place, talk to your ISP that you're already using in your offices. They'll have some mitigation that you could purchase. Um, you may need dedicated hardware on-prem, um, but then also you could use a SaaS service. And what I would recommend there, do a tabletop exercise. And if you needed to, to use a SaaS service, F5 has a SaaS service, Akamai has a SaaS service for scrubbing denial of service attacks. Know how you would spin it up um, and have that plan. Because if you are under attack, that is not the time to uh, start Googling, DDoS filtering and figure it out. Already have stuff in place, have a master service agreement set up, whatever the case may be so that you can swing over to it in the event you need to. So now on the, the let's go hunting bit, this would be now we're saying, you know, the Iranian threat actors are in our threat model and it is a higher up uh, a bit for you. This could be, if you talk about, I've had a lot of questions over media, I know you have as well, like verticals, like what verticals do you think need to be proactively looking for Iranian threat actors? I mean, we've kind of mentioned a couple of them already, but like financial services, uh, the energy sector, ICS, you know, controlling companies. Um, I think those are probably the main kind of two or three. Um, I think outside of that, you know, people who, uh, companies who would get wrapped up within, uh, well, I guess I, I, should, I should say people, companies who are United States based specifically might be more prone to attack Obviously, we talk about collateral damage already. That could be wrapped up in there as well. But I think in terms of the sectors, those are the two main ones that come to mind for me. Yeah, I think you saw some very specific uh, comments from Iran um, about any other uh, allies that got involved right. in retaliation there. So, uh, and you've seen U.S. allies kind of distance themselves um, and, and, and recommend de-escalation which i think is a great thing in general so but it could expand you know you don't you know because obviously we're an international company uh, so for our you know asia pacific our european customers depending on how things go and who partners uh you could see other um countries interests become targets uh very quickly so you definitely want to follow it um what we put in here was miter attack groups um, and I'm a big fan of MITRE ATT&CK and you could put the, you know, ABT33 in here is the example we use and you can go in and look at some of the techniques that they're using, spear phishing, mm -hmm. account takeover, credential stuffing, that sort of thing. And then you can look and map your controls to the known tactics from these actors. Now these are open source ones. This would be one, uh, one avenue that you would have. You also have commercial threat intelligence providers like us and others that can help you out. And then also critically, you'll have your own incidents. Uh, and so uh, making sure that when you have incident response activities that you are capturing, I mean, this will be your best source of intelligence. You're capturing the techniques that the adversaries are using, the tools, the command and control, the infrastructure, uh, so that you have your own um, library of your own intrusions that you can then build into your defense. And then you can hunt across other parts of your organization for the same types of techniques. Yeah. I think to the de-escalation point, you know, how we've seen 
threat actors, nation state threat actors respond to things like economic sanctions in the past has been with uh, cyber attacks and cyber, you know, cyber retaliation for the economic sanctions. And I bring that up because in Trump, in President Trump's speech um, about the incident, he was threatening economic sanctions against Iran. And so, you know, we have this physical de-escalation, but that doesn't mean that in, in the cyber world um, that this is all done. I, in fact, I think it, in my opinion, I think it's a little bit to the opposite. I think that it could see an increase in, in cyber related activity because of economic sanctions and just kind of ongoing, you know, tensions between, between the two. So I think this is a good, um, you know, let's go hunting. Let's, let's be sure that we're prepared and let's go see if anything's out there um, in our, in our environment. So the last one, now I wrote this before we had any retaliation um, from Iran, but it's just uh, remember that revenge is a dish best served cold. Now, interestingly enough, I've talked to a number of people that weren't familiar with this adage. Um, but basically my point here is that, you know, Iran's going to um, respond um, probably multiple ways and multiple times. I think they made their initial response, which probably helps the domestic audience there. Um, and it was a legitimate response um, targeting, you know, uh, different locations on, on that air base. Uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be at a time of their choosing, you know, for political advantage and for military uh, advantage, or military impact as well. It's an election year. You know, I don't think we should say coast is clear. Yeah. Retaliation is complete. I agree with your comments that I think the cyber cold war component of this is just going to continue. So I think the key thing here would be don't be complacent. Um, you know, use your threat intelligence providers like digital shadows to, to give you some insight into what we're observing, um, use your own investigations, as I alluded to uh, before, but don't be complacent and think that it's not um, done. Cyber uh, warfare is a long game, um, and Stuxnet was a long time ago, and we have continued to see uh, tit for tat in the cyberspace there. Right, for sure. Um, and now we've kind of alluded to this uh, uh, throughout, but you know, we're in a space now where we've had at least the, the de-escalation, which I think was great. I think waking up the other morning, not knowing what we might see on the news was quite concerning. But I, I think, again, the key, my key takeaway on this is, you know, do your due diligence. Um, don't become complacent. Also set expectations with executives, talking about communicating up the chain of command. Uh, despite the kinetic, I would, I would not use the word kinetic de-escalation with my executives, talk about using terms, but despite, you know, the things toning down, the rhetoric toning down, it doesn't mean it's all clear, especially if you have Iran um, in your threat model. So that would be my takeaway on this. What, what do you think, Harrison? Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that uh, pretty much completely. I think um, it's hard to say anything else other than don't uh, don't be complacent with kind of what's going on, right? I mean, I think the physical side of things will obviously get much more attention in the shorter term because it's, you know, it's physical, it's happening. It's um, you can see the effects of it. Um, but that's not to say that there's nothing going on behind the scenes in terms of cyber attacks or cyber um, capabilities being built up, infrastructure being raised, um, tools being developed, things like that. Um, that stuff is, most likely going on on both sides um, of, the, of the of the world um, so yeah so don't don't just kind of rest on the fact that you know we've kind of subsided in the in the physical space let's just keep an eye on defending the networks and see what's uh, see what's going on that's a good point I and I didn't mention it on the on the best serve cold section of the blog I talk about you know net new operations and you basically were just alluding to it if if Iran has now decided um, and their mission planning uh, is going to have a particular target that's a US uh, government agency or a company whatever it is you know they're going to have to build out the tooling update tooling they're going to have to get their infrastructure and they're going to have to prepare for an offensive cyber operation and that can take time so yeah I think yeah be on the lookout I know it's kind of this may be the most generic advice that you could have. It's, it's almost <laughs> like thoughts and prayers equivalent. Like, what does that actually mean? But right. we do need to have a, a heightened sense of diligence if you have Iran, Iran on your threat model. And not to get too deep into, you know, specific threat actors and stuff that's happened. But, you know, you look at somebody like APT34 oil rig, you know, they had a lot of their tools, a lot of their infrastructure was kind of leaked online. And a lot of it had been kind of spread out there. So like, it's, it's doubtful that they would be reusing that same stuff. So if you look at somebody like that group, they would be looking to develop some new stuff that 
you know hasn't been seen before um so it just goes along to that same point the uh the final this was not in the blog it's something that i did later in the week and this is perhaps a little bit of a niche joke um but i i made a a comment on a twitter this week about if you're really freaking out about iran you need to be worried about the Nilfgaardian empire now if you haven't read the witcher books or haven't played the witcher games or seen the, seen the new uh, Witcher starring uh, Superman. <laughs> you may not get this. Um, I kind of laughed about this tweet because I tagged Miter Attack and I had said that Miter added them to their group and Miter Attack had <laughs> responded to me with a, a Geralt kind of <laughs> video, which just kind of made my day. Um, so yeah, this is a very geek centric reference. But if you're done with the Witcher, I hope you enjoy this one as much as I enjoyed writing it. <laughs> it like, oh, I actually had a good joke. Blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. Um, to wrap up, you know, there's a, several ways to, to kind of stay in touch with us. You know, actually we're gonna have in the latest version of Shadow Talk, we're gonna have a, a segment on Iran. I, I expect Shadow Talk's our podcast if you haven't listened to that before. Right, we're gonna comes be out once a week. Yeah, once yeah. a week uh, at the beginning. Well, at the end of the week, yeah, uh, it'll come out. A lot of people will listen to it at the beginning of the week, just as they start their week. So we're gonna continue to track this um, on Shadow Talk. You can also sign up for our intelligence summary as well, so you can get a, week, a weekly email uh, that would include things like this, but also cybercrime related things, other um, interesting stories from the week that you may not have the time to be aware of and then we'll have some suggestions there uh, any other shout outs that you would give harrison i think one would be the blog the status blog that i wrote which is basically just kind of an overview of kind of what's happened all the responses from each side of the of the conflict um and then also you know a answering the main question of you know have there been any sort of cyber attacks going back and forth um as of right now you know we've really just mainly seen the defacements again I plan to update that blog and keep it updated as, as things kind of progress. Um, so, so be sure to check back on that uh, whenever you, know, you think something might be going on, just be sure to check that out. And then if you happen to be a Digital Shadows customer, uh, we declared what we call a major incident, which has a whole separate number of um, responses and updates and things like that that we do and, and, and tracking. So, uh, so we declared a major incident, basically rallied the whole organization around doing our intelligence assessments. But then we also were creating searches for our customers, helping them with tags and subscriptions to monitor for this sort of stuff. So if you are a Digital Shadows customer, um, Iran's a new threat model, you're interested, you know, feel free to reach out to the client success team and they can help tailor um, your config in, in Searchlight, in Shadow Search to help monitor for this stuff so that you make sure that you get anything new that we put out on it. Yeah, we've heard from people that it's really useful um, for finding, or at least being covered, you know, in the case that something else goes on, uh, that they'll be made aware of it. Yep. We want to make sure that the work that we put out, you guys get. So, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to hit us up on Twitter, social media, um, talk to the client team. Um, otherwise, you know, thanks for joining us and uh, stay tuned for more. Thanks.